guys and hopefully I will be back at the end of this next week to uh, be back and teach you guys killed me that I wasn't there for development you guys know that probably was one of my favorite units and I know you guys really miss me but uh, joking aside thank you very much for the cards and the emails that you guys sent me um, they really helped because last week I was actually in the hospital for the first time so I'm out I'm doing better and hopefully I will see you guys by Friday at the latest maybe on Thursday so, right now what I want you to do is, there's no note guide for this PowerPoint. So what I need you to do is to open up a new blank set of notes, and um, what you, the way we could do this is basically is you could, we'll display the notes. I want you guys to write down the bullet points and some of the elaboration. And what you can do is, one person will just pause the notes uh, so everybody can get everything down and then add in my elaboration. It's not enough to just write down the bullet points. You do need to write down the extra notes as well. So let's start this PowerPoint. So agriculture and its history through the first revolution. Here we go. Okay, so what is agriculture? The deliberate tending of crops and livestock to produce food, feed, and fiber. So what's the difference between food, feed, and fiber? Well, we eat food, so what is feed? Think about it for a second. I would make a joke if I was in class with one of the kids if, if I could, but feed is what we actually give to livestock. So it's not for human consumption, it's for some kind of animal consumption. And fiber, I hope you guys would be able to figure out. It's not a type of cereal, it is something that we make our clothes out of. So food, feed, and fiber. All right, and the United States is very agriculturally rich. So this is an example. This picture is an example of um, soybeans in South Dakota. Excitement. Okay, organic agriculture. Now this is really trendy. This is kind of a big fad. The production of crops without the use of synthetic or industrial produced pesticides and fertilizers, right? Everyone talks about how great ag organic agriculture is. And I really do. I buy some organic produce. However... If we were, so a lot of people would be like, well, why isn't everything organic? Because the world would starve, guys. We would not be able to feed the entire world if we used, if organic agriculture went widespread. So you see in the United States is looking at the, at the, um, if we look at the graph on the left, you can see that organic agriculture has been, is soaring in popularity because there are, there are some perceived or um, believed benefits to organic agriculture. However, it's not sustainable on a large scale to feed the entire world. We would, there would be mass starvation. So while it's a good thing, it can't be implemented on large scale. Okay, so this breaks it down into this next part, classification of economic activity, breaks it down into different ways that we... Um, that we organize activities within a nation. Now, the United States will have all levels of economic activity. Developing countries won't sometimes, but the United States has all levels of economic activity. So primary economic activity are those products closest to the ground. What the heck does that mean? So things that are produced very close to the ground. So if you think about it for a second, what would be some examples of that? Well, fishing right close to the water or to the ground fishing would be an example mining or any kind of excavation would be another example and so would farming right so when you think of primary economic activities I want you to think of anything that require that is basically taken out of the ground is the best way to think about it um, technology can be used um, but it's, it's, it doesn't necessarily go hand in hand because, as we're going to look later, pri countries with high levels of, pr of primary economic activity usually do not have very high amounts of technology. Okay, secondary economic activity. Those activities that take a primary product and manufacture it, change it into something um, else. Okay, so it's taking those things that we take from primary economic activity and transfer it into something else. So an example, now I should have put a Tesla, that's a Porsche, but um, an example would be after we excavate the steel or any of the other raw materials that are needed to be used to make a car, 
This would be secondary economic activity. Think of manufacturing as secondary economic activity. A nice quilt, if you will, would be another example. Um, after we take the fiber from cotton and we, we make it into something, would be secondary economic activity. And so would energy, um, energy creation, right? So the idea of windmills would be secondary economic activity. All right? And then, so we see developing countries have definitely primary economic activity, and countries like China, the BRIC countries, will have a lot of secondary economic activity. In the United States, we actually don't have a ton. We want some sec more secondary economic activity taking place. Tertiary economic activity, part of the service industry, connecting producers and consumers and facilitating commerce and trade. Well, what the heck does that mean? Well, that could be tourism, would be an example of tertiary economic activity. Um, another type of economic activity would be restaurants, right? Service industry. So think about things like going to the mall, going to different places, things like that would be examples of it. And lastly, one of my favorites, movies, right? So entertainment, that would be tertiary economic activity. The United States is more heavy in tertiary, quaternary, and quinary. We're going to learn about those last two on the next slide. But this is where the United States is heavy in, and this is where a lot of developing countries want to transition into. Okay, quaternary and quinary economic activity. A way to describe a knowledge-based part of the economy, which typically includes services such as information generation, sharing, information technology, consultation, education, research and development, financial planning, and other knowledge-based services. So this would be things such as I would be part of the quaternary economic activity, right, because I'm a teacher. Information generation would be things like research. These would be things like working for Apple, right? Financial planning, working in a bank, you would be part of a quaternary economic activity. These are things that developing countries don't really have much of. And quinary economic activity is the highest level of decision making and research in a society or economy. This sector would include top executives or officials in such fields as government, science, universities, profit, healthcare, culture, and the media. So this is the absolute highest. It's kind of hard to understand the difference between quaternary and quinary. Think of quinary as um, research done at, at the very highest levels, right? Because quaternary would be regular level research, so like trying out new drugs for the FDA. Quinary would be the absolute cutting edge of technology, the absolute cutting edge of things in the government, such as, such as like the CIA and the NSA, would be part of the quinary economic activity. Okay, guys, we're going to pick back up with types of these different agricultures. So we just went over the different classifications from primary through quaternary. What I want us to do now is we're going to kind of look at how these all, um, how these manifest themselves in the in different economies. Okay, so how goods are produced in agriculture. The proportion of people employed in the sector of the economy gives us insight into that production. So if we look at agriculture in Guatemala, the agriculture sector is 22.7% of their GDP, yet 50% of their labor force is in agriculture. So what does that tell us about the type of agriculture that they're doing? Well, we know that this has to be a lot of primary economic activity, and there must not be a very high level of technology being implemented in Guatemala, if 50% of their labor force is working in farming, they cannot, they, it just, does, that just doesn't make sense. They have to be using very low labor saving techniques in order to have that por proportion of their, um, that proportion of their economy involved in agriculture. But if we look at Canada, it's 2.3% of their GDP, and their labor force is 3% in agriculture. So Canada must be using lots of labor-saving techniques. And what does this fact say about Canada is saying that, obviously, their, a majority of their GDP must not be from economic or from agriculture. And then we look at the United States. It's only 1.2% of our GDP, and it's less than 2% of our labor force is involved in agriculture. 
Many support the agriculture through research, so through quaternary and quinary sectors. When we get to our agribusiness part of this unit, we're going to learn about research and things called GMOs or genetically modified organisms and how that impacts agriculture in the United States. And total agriculture production is at an all-time high in the United States, but the labor force is at an all-time low. So what does that tell us? Well, it's the exact opposite of Guatemala. We are using a lot of labor-saving techniques. We're using a lot of technology, a lot of machinery, a lot of things that make us have high yields and high production, but very low inputs from us. Okay, that's a very important term, is yield, is how is basically how productive a unit of land is. Okay, I want you to write this in. So if there's high yields, that indicates that there's high levels of technology. As it says, we are at an all-time high in the United States for our yield, but an all-time low for our amount of labor force. It's kind of an important fact. I know I keep pushing it in. Okay? All right, so we're going to look at a little bit of history now of our of the agricultural movement for humans in general. Okay, so let's start with hunters and gatherers. Before agriculture, hunting, gathering, and fishing would be the way for societies to eat and survive because we were, we were a, um, I can't think of the word, we were a moving society. We were a society that didn't, nomadic, there it is. We were a nomadic society. We didn't stay in one place for a long time. So that kind of agriculture leads to a more sedentary or a non-nomadic lifestyle. So before agriculture, we just hunted, gathered, and fished. The region would impact what people hunted and gathered for survival, but clearly by whatever was available in that area. Tools for hunting and gathering, work to control and use fire. We, this is, so hunting and gathering clearly is something that was very, very early um, on in our history. There are still groups of hunting and gathering today, and we find them in parts of southern Africa, the San people of southern Africa, the aboriginals of Australia, and the Native Americans of Brazil would still be considered hunters and gatherers. And this is a picture of a hunter and gatherer in Africa. Small, the San. They live in small, scattered mobile bands. Most common prey are antelopes, wildebeest, and other small game. But their region impacts what they're going to get. We would not be what, hunting wildebeests and antelopes in Arlington Heights. So some more info about the hunters and gatherers. Their settlements were not permanent, as I said. Their populations were always small because there was never a constant source of food. It, the food resource really fluctuated a lot. Early hunters, hunters and gatherers lived in wetter and better environments and had an easier life than those of modern day. So the San and the Native, Native Americans in Brazil, it's not as easy as it once was um, just because of the encroaching modern society. We see that in eastern North America, the places that the hunters and gatherers would live would be in the forests, eating the wildlife and the nuts, Pacific Coast America, salmon fishing, the Aleuts of the tundra would would prey on the caribou herds, and in interior North America, buffalo herds. So you, we've learned about that before, probably in middle school, about the Native Americans hunting the buffalo. Okay, so what led to the first agricultural revolution? So why did the hunters and gatherers stop hunting and gathering, and what, why did they become sedentary? Well, the first part would be plant domestication. Genetic modification of a plant such that its reproductive success depends on human intervention. So this is the idea that these plants will not grow unless we specifically plant them and weed and make sure that they survive. Carl Sawyer is a really famous geographer. We've learned about him before. But he has a few theories on the first agricultural revolution and how it started. He's famous for his book, Agricultural Origins and Dispersals of 1952. It's a great read. Um, I would highly recommend it. That little bit of sarcasm if you can't tell. Believe there was 11 separate centers of agricultural origin. Don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to know all 11. He believed that vegetative planting or root crops started in Southeast Asia about 14,000 years ago. 
It was followed by seed agriculture in Southwest Asia 10 to 12,000 years ago. So we believe that seed agricultural started in Southwest Asia, which we understand as the Fertile Crescent, and then vegetative planting, the first root crop started in South Asia. So if you had a multiple choice question that asked you, where does Carl Sawyer believe that the first agricultural revolution began, you would say Southeast Asia, because that was first, and then seed agriculture and the Fertile Crescent. You do, know, you do need to know the difference between those two. And the difference between a root and a seed crop? A root crop is where you need to take a cutting of the, of the plant and replant it. A seed crop is just as is, it sounds like. You would just plant the seeds. But a root crop needs to take a cutting from an other plant and you replant that into the ground. Okay, so if we look here, these would be vegetative planted hearths. So where we think they began and where they, we think they, um, the secondary. There are several main hearths or centers of origin for vegetative crops, crops for roots from which the crops diffuse to other areas. Carl Sawyer, again, believes that Southeast Asia was the primary hearth and it diffused out from there. However, you can see that there are other theories outside of Southeast Asia. All right, this is then another, this is a similar map that shows for seed agriculture. Okay, so that leads us to the first agricultural revolution. The first domestication of plants was probably in Southeast Asia, root crops, where we think were taro, yams, and bananas about 14,000 years ago. Then, like I said, Southwest Asia, domesticated cereal crops such as wheat, barley, and oats about 10,000 years ago. In Mesoamerica, we believe that the first crops grown were maize, squash, and beans. And in Africa, it was millet, sorghum, and watermelons, we believe, for the first crops grown. Out of all of those, the watermelons are probably the most tasty out of any of those. Bananas, too. Okay, so... The Fertile Crescent, where the planned cultivation of seed crops began. Because of seed selection, plants got bigger over time. This generated a surplus of wheat and barley, and the first integration of plant growing and animal raising, they used crops to feed the livestock and livestock to help grow the crops because we would use them as to help pull the plows. We would use them as their um, excrement as fertilizer. So this is where we see the integration of plant and animal raising. Um, we believe to be in, fer in the Fertile Crescent. So what we would say is the f origins of modern farming began in the Fertile Crescent. Um, I want to talk about that seed selection. Plants got bigger over time. What would happen is people chose the plants that produced the highest yield and the best, um, the best fruit or the best crop. So what happened is just through, through basically people selecting them, the, the plants that either produced smaller fruit or less desirable fruit, just didn't get planted the next year. So that is how we had this kind of selection of larger plants over, the, over time, is, we ch is that we passed on those traits that we thought that were most desirable. It's kind of interesting, so think about that for a second, because it's not very complicated, but it's interesting, is that we chose to discontinue certain lines of plants because they weren't producing enough, and we did choose the ones that produced higher amounts to continue to plant. All right, so we see Fertile Crescent area. This is a, a little bit of a closer. This is the spread of early farming, and this is kind of where we see that there were just wild sheep and goats, and that's kind of one of the early reasons for why we believe that they were domesticated is because they also were present in the area at that time. All right, so speaking of animals, domestication of animals starts when people become more settled. Reasons animals might have been domesticated, first, they were maybe for pets. I mean, how can you not love that picture? Ceremonial purposes, they attached themselves as scavengers because we didn't really have a good way to get rid of our trash, so a lot of times we just threw it outside, and that would attract the animals. Um, 
protection from pet predators and orphaned young. That's why we, we don't really know, we don't have an exact reason why people all of a sudden decided to domesticate animals other than the idea of, of keeping them for food. But um, these are the theories of how it happened. So the first agricultural revolution didn't lead to what we consider today as, um, as farming. It, was be it began as subsistence agriculture. This is a very important term. Highlight this. Subsistence agriculture means growing only enough food for survival. All right, now subsistence agriculture isn't just farming. For some people, it's a state of mind. It's a way of life. Land is usually held in common. Surpluses are shared by all. And individual wealth and advancement is limited. So subsistence farming can be seen on, it's never really seen on a large scale, but it can be seen in different villages. And that is um, and that is what we see as this kind of idea of that why there's n individual there's no individual wealth and there's not as much advancement because any kind of surplus you have you give to your neighbors you're not making a profit off of what you're making you're just making enough to survive this also leads to this is where we see that it's hard for families to expand because you're not really having extras the nutrition is not so great So some subsistence farmers are stationary, while others move in search of better land. So this is called shifting cultivation. I'll read this, and then I'm going to explain it a little bit more. An agricultural system in which plots of land are cultivated temporarily and then abandoned. In shifting agriculture, a plot of land is cleared and cultivated for, the, for a short period of time. Then it is abandoned and allowed to revert to its natural vegetation, while the cultivator moves on to another plot. It usually uses multiple crops in a single land parcel. All right, we mainly see this in less developed countries. You'll see this in Central and South America a lot. You'll see this in parts in Africa and parts of Asia as well. So this is the idea that what happens is it's cleared and it's used until the nutrients are, are gone from the soil. Then... It lets whatever the natural vegetation is, the weeds, the natural prairie grasses, anything like that, continue to regrow on that land, right? Letting the land rest. Then when those plants then die on that land, they refertilize that soil, and eventually it could become back, it, you could come back to it. Slash and burn agriculture is another form in which an area of forest is cleared by cutting and burning, and then it is planted, usually for several seasons before being left to return to forest. So what happens is they cut down everything and by burning it, they actually fertilize the soil. It's used again until it's used up, but then they have to let it return to forest so that the soil gets replenished. These are not very sustainable. I mean, they are sustainable, but you have to keep moving. So these are kind of short-term fixes. It's still the first agricultural revolution. We eventually learn how to fix this from that point on. So, colonial and its impact on subsistence farming. In many cases, what we now think of as the center of production for a particular crop is not the place where that crop was originally domesticated. This is actually really interesting. I like this stuff. Corn that we today associate with the American Corn Belt diffused from Central America and Southern Mexico into North America. So I went to a conference once on agriculture. I know it's really exciting. But they were talking about how there's nowhere else in the entire world that is better for growing corn than, and this guy was, this guy was from Nebraska, but he said is Iowa. Nowhere else in the world can we grow better corn than Iowa. And that's true, Illinois, Iowa, the corn belt in the United States, has the highest production of corn of anywhere else in the world. It's the right combination of climate and temperature. However, that's not where it was domesticated. Corn was never a part of our lives. And we're going to talk about this hopefully when I get back, is how it's so interesting that corn is in a little bit of everything that we eat, everything, basically, that we eat. So, not everything, most things that we eat, things you wouldn't even expect corn to be in, but it's because we can produce corn so cheaply and easily in the United States. The Portuguese eventually brought corn across the Atlantic and it became a staple food in Africa as well. So corn, we see it all over the world. It grows well in many different environments. However, not as well as it does in the Midwest. <laughs> 